I feel like my life has been very Cinderella-esque in a way because I never expected any of this to happen to me. I never expected to actually get to do this. So getting to play shows every night, and it's just unbelievable, and I'm so thankful every day for it. Taylor Swift is a seven-time Grammy winner and the youngest recipient in history of the music industry's highest honor, the Grammy Award for Album of the Year. I've never been presumptuous about dreams. When you have crazy dreams like, I wonder what it would be like to win a Grammy someday. She is the only artist in history to have an album hit the one million first week sales figure three times. She's a household name whose insanely catchy yet deeply personal self-penned songs transcend music genres and a savvy businesswoman who has built a childhood dream into an empire. I just feel very lucky to get to take my music to the places I've gotten to take it to, uh, just geographically. I, I never thought I'd get to go to these places in my life, and the fact that I get to go to these places and play music, and play music I've written about my life, and look down into the crowd and know that the fans relate to that in some way, even though they live halfway across the world, it's an honor. Swift is known for narrative songs about her personal experiences. As a songwriter, she has been honored by the Nashville Songwriters Association and the Songwriters Hall of Fame. She is one of the best-selling artists of all time, having sold more than 40 million albums and 130 million single downloads. I never would have imagined that that would be a possibility for a goal. Um, I was hoping to be able to sell one record, be able to make a record, to be able to have songs that people could hear. That's like, the fact that that's happening now and it's all the fans and I'm just at a loss again for words. In 2015, Taylor Swift became the youngest woman ever to be included on Forbes' 100 Most Powerful Women list, ranking at number 65. It seems there is nothing Taylor Swift can't do. It occurs to me how lucky I am, actually. I get so excited about it, and I wake up with a smile on my face, and honestly never thought I'd get to do this stuff, so being here is unbelievable. We invite you to discover the unique journey of one of music's modern-day superstars, Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift, and she is just what you expect. You know, she's genuine, she's down to earth, she's friendly, she cares about her fans, she makes time for her fans. Uh, she is what, you know, what you see is what you get. On the other hand, you don't get to be where Taylor Swift is without a lot of determination, a lot of self-belief, and, and the ability to tell people no uh, when they ask you to do something. At the same time, she really is a sweet girl who, as she says, her best friend's her mom, and that really does uh, remain true. The numerous records and achievements don't tell Taylor's story half as well as she could. After all, it's the intangibles that elevate Swift into the stratosphere of our pop culture planet, allowing the 25-year-old singer-songwriter to orbit in a more rarefied air. Her large-scale charitable contributions are one thing, but it's in the small gestures the notes of compassion she posts on her Instagram account of lovelorn fans, the genuine hug she distributes without discretion, where Swift proves time and time again that platinum-selling, record-setting success has not changed her inherent nature. When I was a little kid and uh, I would see singers on TV playing concerts or music videos and stuff, I, I would always think to myself, if, if I was ever lucky enough by some crazy, crazy chance I could ever do that, I would want to sign autographs all day, every day for anybody who wanted one. I'd want to take pictures with everybody and, you know, I just, I wanted to say thank you for all the stuff that they've done for me, you know. They've made my life really fun.
One of the interesting things about Taylor is that she is both this massive star, but her audience feels like she's almost their best friend. That was incredible. Like yesterday, um, we were, we've been watching all the tweets from Big Machine Records, and so we won the uh, wristbands yesterday, and I started crying instantly. <laughs> And then when we finally got called down here, I started crying. It's just way too overwhelming. We have my phone, which <laughs> I've never had let anyone touch this phone pretty much. So it was only for Taylor. And then my hand, which that's never ever coming off. That's If I could get it tattooed there, I would. But <laughs> One of the great virtues in country music is humility. Um, you, you, you can fake humility and pretend to be humble, but you can't do that for very long. You, you honestly do have to have humility to be a country star, to be able to say, look, here I am, I'm laying myself in front of you, I hope you like me, because I'm not better than you, I am you. You know, I'm not singing about things that are alien to you. I'm trying to sing things that you feel as I do. Um, that sense of humility of, of I'm not better than the audience is very, very deep and very, very profound in the culture. I, I think Taylor understands her brand better than maybe anybody else out there. And she understands just how much her success relies on the people that listen to her music. And, and she makes a point of making them feel like they're in the game and that they are that they are contributing to her success. Uh, you know, when there's a fan voted award show and she wins, she makes a point of thanking everybody. She makes a point of acting the way that you would think somebody would act if they had just won some huge award. And, and so the fans always feel like they are, that they are part of her story as well as watching the story play out. Meet and greets are an incredible part of country music. You you meet your art, you press the flesh. You gotta be able to hug a fat lady to be in country music, period. I'm having a blast. I'm, I'm surprised that my legs aren't hurting yet. I'm surprised that there's no aching going on. Um, I'm, I'm really having so much fun because like, we're all having a really good time today and they're all telling me really sweet stories and they've given, look at all the bracelets that all the girls have given me today. This is just today. And um, I don't know, this is just, this has been one of the coolest days I can remember. In mid-2015, Taylor Swift took on the world's second largest technology company over a dispute regarding paying royalties to musicians. Apple announced that it would not be paying royalties to record companies during the three-month trial period of its new paid-for-streaming service. Taylor Swift made her feelings about the payment policy clear via an open letter on her Tumblr page. Explaining why she had refused to allow the company to stream her latest album, 1989, she wrote, I find it shocking, disappointing, and completely unlike this historically progressive and generous company. Three months is a long time to go unpaid, and it's unfair to ask anyone to work for nothing. We don't ask for free iPhones. Please don't ask us to provide you with our music for no compensation. Just 24 hours after Swift's open letter, Apple announced it had experienced a sudden change of heart about its controversial plan. The news came not via an official statement, but via a Twitter message sent directly to Taylor Swift, adding to the startling nature of what the music scene was witnessing, the humbling of a major corporation by a 25-year-old musician. There is no doubting that Taylor Swift is a phenomenal force in today's music scene. But to truly understand her colossal rise to the top, we have to go back to where it all started. Taylor Swift was born on December 13, 1989 in Reading, Pennsylvania. 
Swift spent the early years of her life on a Christmas tree farm. Well, Taylor Swift, known as America's Sweetheart, really did have very much an idyllic American childhood. I mean, she grew up on a Christmas tree farm, for heaven's sake, with a very close family unit. Her dad's a stockbroker. She has one brother, Austin very close with her family. Taylor has said repeatedly her mom is her best friend. Swift and her brother were raised in the Presbyterian faith and attended vacation Bible school every summer. When Swift was nine years old, the family moved to a rented house in the suburban town of Wyomissing, Pennsylvania. It was there where she attended Wyomissing Area Junior School. Taylor would regularly vacation at her parents' waterfront vacation home in New Jersey and described it as the place where most of her childhood memories were formed. At the age of seven, Swift became interested in musical theater and performed in numerous Burke's Youth Theater Academy productions. Swift later turned her attention to country music, with Shania Twain being one of her biggest influences. That kind of combination of pop and country music. Also, Shania has a very glamorous look and a lot of fun with her videos, and I think Taylor likes that. The other thing is Shania sings a lot about real life, what she's gone through herself, very honest and open ballads, and I think Taylor resonates with that as well. She would spend her weekends performing at local festivals, coffee houses, fairs, karaoke concerts, garden clubs, Boy Scout meetings, and sporting events. At the age of 11, after many failed attempts, Swift won a local talent competition and was given the opportunity to appear as the opening act for Charlie Daniels at a Strauss Town Amphitheater. After watching a Behind the Music episode about Faith Hill, Swift felt sure she needed to go to Nashville, Tennessee to pursue a music career. At the age of 11, she traveled with her mother to Nashville to submit a demo of Dolly Parton and Dixie Chicks karaoke covers with record labels along Music Row. And I remember talking to her about uh, how she would walk down the street in, in Nashville. It's called Music Row because all the um, music companies, uh, record labels, publishers, uh, there's a uh, vast array of them all along the same street. So you can just go up and down the street and hit all these different companies. And she would go from door to door, knocking on the doors and go, hi, I'm Taylor, I write songs. Um, would you give me a deal? And, you know, at, at that point, an 11 year old isn't, isn't gonna get much credibility, uh, but she kept at it. Nashville is the last place I believe, not just in America, but in the world where the craft of songwriting is nurtured and respected and loved. And I, by, the, by songwriting, I don't mean, mm, baby, mm, baby, mm. That's a song in LA. It is not a song in Nashville. That just will not do. You know, you are supposed to say something when you sing in a club in Nashville. Anybody that wants to be a country singer has to come through Nashville. Uh, you don't you don't have to always live in Nashville once you've become a successful country singer but it's almost impossible to do it without living here at some point what i always like to say is that the difference between Nashville and Los Angeles and New York is that in Nashville at least they'll listen to you before they tell you no after receiving numerous rejections, she realized she had to change her style in order to be noticed. When she was 12, she was taught how to play three chords on a guitar, inspiring her to write her first song, Lucky You. In 2003, Swift and her parents started working with New York-based music manager Dan Dimtro. With Dimtro's help, Swift modeled for Abercrombie & Fitch as part of their Rising Stars campaign, had an original song included on a Maybelline compilation CD, and attended meetings with major record labels. After performing original songs at an RCA record showcase, the eighth grader was given an artist development deal and began making frequent trips to Nashville with her mother. 
To help Taylor break into country music, her father transferred to the Nashville office of Merrill Lynch, and the family relocated to a lakefront house in Hendersonville, Tennessee. In Tennessee, Swift attended Hendersonville High School for her freshman and sophomore years. Later, to accommodate her touring schedule, Swift transferred to the Aaron Academy, a private Christian school, which offered homeschooling services. Swift moved to Nashville when she was 13 years old, having signed an artist development deal with RCA Records. Well, I think it took a lot of chutzpah to, for Taylor to get her parents to move their entire family to Nashville and then uh, physically to handle her demo tapes and bring them to basically every record producer in town. I get asked all the time by aspiring artists, should I move to Nashville? It can happen and does happen outside of Nashville. But my personal philosophy is if you want to hunt tigers, you go to the jungle. And this is the jungle. You've got more songwriters here than you've got anywhere else. The record labels are here, the producers are here, the other singers are here, the whole industry is here. And so if you want to start meeting the people that you need to know to put together a successful team to make you the kind of star that you want to be, you got to be in Nashville. And I think in particular that's true if you're a writer because if you want to learn the craft of country songwriting, this is, the, this is the school right here. This is the university. This is the graduate level learning program. I think it would be a mistake to assume that you become famous overnight without rejection. And I think Taylor is a good example of someone who never wavered in her determination to be famous and in her self-belief that she had what it took. And it, ultimately, she was proved right. Well, for me, you know, the, the long period of time occurred from when I was 10 years old to when I was about 15. I mean, I spent that entire time trying to get a record deal and um, actually moved to Nashville when I was 13 and it didn't get a record deal right away, didn't get a record deal at all. So I signed a publishing deal and became a staff songwriter at Sony ATV Publishing. And so I would write every single day after school because it, it was a job, you know, I was, I was a paid songwriter when I was 14, so I wrote songs in Nashville for two and a half years. She proceeded to work with experienced Music Row songwriters and eventually formed a lasting working relationship with Liz Rose. Swift saw Rose performing at an RCA songwriter event and suggested that they write together. I remember uh, Jody Williams, uh, who at that time was Liz Rose's uh, song publisher, and he said something to Liz like, why are you wasting your time with this 14-year-old kid? And Liz said to him, she pulls her own weight. In a, in a songwriting session, she's no kid. And that, I thought that little anecdote right there said volumes about who this person was, who Taylor Swift really was. After performing at a BMI Songwriter Circle Showcase in 2004 in New York, Swift became the youngest songwriter ever hired by the Sony ATV Tree Publishing House. And they really took a chance on me that I was the youngest person they ever signed. So um, I'd been writing since I was 12 years old. And when I was 14, I really started to co-write around Nashville. And um, it was really, really fun because I'd been writing by myself. Um, and getting, getting involved in the whole songwriting community in Nashville really helped me along and helped me on my way to, you know, becoming an artist. Swift left RCA Records when she was 15. The company wanted her to record the work of other songwriters and wait until she was 18 to release an album, but she felt ready to launch her career with her own material. They wanted her to sing songs. They wanted to pick for her, to work with the producers. They wanted to assign to her and she had a vision of what she wanted her music to sound like and she would tell me that she hears this stuff in her head she hears how it sounds in her head and so the challenge is then to go into the studio and translate into the real world what she's hearing in her head for me songwriting is everything everything you know i i didn't want to sign with a record label that wouldn't let me write all my own music for me making an album is about telling stories, making confessions, and writing songs so detailed that each guy knows which song is about him, you know? It's like, they're all very personal, and um, so songwriting has been everything as far as me being an artist and being able to say what I want to say. It's been wonderful. 
The kid had ice water in her veins. She just knew what she wanted and she had a very, very astonishing sense of self about her. To take that opportunity, which anybody would kill for, a development deal at a major record company like RCA, and basically say, no, I'm, this isn't for me. It's not working. This isn't what I want. Uh, just is jaw-dropping. It showed that Taylor didn't just want to be famous. Most people come to town, they'll do whatever it takes to be successful. You know, if, they, if somebody wants them to sing other people's songs, fine. Other people sing their songs, absolutely. It'll bring in royalties. You know, for Taylor, she wanted to be on a record label, but she didn't want to do other people's songs. She wanted to have a publishing deal, but she didn't want other people to do her songs. For a, a, a kid of that age and at that level in her career to basically have, be, have that clear-headed a sense of who she was and what she wanted, I've never seen anything like it. All along, it hasn't been about just being famous. It's been about being successful, doing what she wants to do. She's always had her own vision about how she wanted to do it. And she was willing to give up pretty much a sure thing to do things the way that she wanted to do them. Thank you. It's a song I wrote about ex-girlfriends who don't exactly know that they're ex-girlfriends. I think y'all know what I'm talking about. This is called Permanent Marker. industry showcase at Nashville's Bluebird Cafe in 2005, Swift caught the attention of Scott Borchetta, a DreamWorks Records executive who was preparing to form his own independent record label, Big Machine Records. She became one of the label's first signings, with her father purchasing a 3% stake in the fledgling company at an estimated cost of $120,000. Swift began working on her debut album shortly after signing her record deal. After experimenting with veteran Nashville producers, Swift persuaded Big Machine to hire her demo producer, Nathan Chapman. It was his first time recording a studio album, but Swift felt they had the right chemistry. She wrote three of the album's songs alone, including two singles, and co-wrote the remaining eight. Her self-titled debut album was released in October 2006. The New York Times described it as a small masterpiece of pop-minded country, both wide eyes and cynical, held together by Ms. Swift's firm, pleading voice. Following the debut single, Tim McGraw, four other singles were released through 2007 and 2008, Our Song, Picture to Burn, Should Have Said No, and Teardrops on My Guitar. It's called Teardrops on My Guitar, and uh, I wrote it about a situation that I went through when I was in high school when I sat next to this guy in class and I had the biggest crush on him and he had no idea. So every single day he would come in and sit down and talk to me about his girlfriend and uh, I got sick and tired of it one day and so I wrote this song about it and um, 
Well, needless to say, I'm guessing the secret's out at this point. <laughs> well, I think what was so extraordinary about Taylor's first album is that there were so many hits on the album, and as one song would become, you know, go straight to number one, another one was coming out. I think Taylor Swift took everyone by surprise with that first album. I think what took me by surprise was the maturity of this kid. And it, and it started small. It was it was not one of those debut albums that comes out and is at number one on the charts and then kind of falls. It was a build and a build and a build and a build. And it you know, and it kept selling over several years and is still putting up, you know, one or two thousand units every week. So people are still discovering that first album. The dream for me, you know, I always just wanted to make it in country music. That's what I wanted. I mean, I think your dreams change as you start to achieve more of them. I'd love to write songs for other artists. I'd love to have a double platinum album. You know, I think part of being in this business is being competitive and, and being somewhat restless, always wanting to achieve more than you have, and it's kind of like playing yourself. You know, you want to beat what you've already done. So um, I'm just hoping that, you know, I have a second album that does as well as the first, and, you know, someday get to be a headliner and always, be the same person that I started out as. So with, with that album, Taylor tapped in to a market that country music doesn't always get, which is teenage girls. And I think that album more maybe than any of the rest of them was really, it was, you know, it was, it was an album by a teenage girl for teenage girls. Country's market is women, but it's usually women in their 30s and 40s that's kind of the core country demographic. And so she was really bringing new people into the format at the same time that she was starting to win over some of the people that were already country listeners. It's been amazing, you know, just all the things that have happened, seeing my album go double platinum, getting to tour with my heroes and topping it all off with like a Grammy nomination. I'm just, I'm really, really in awe of it all. I first met her um, in Nashville after she just uh, had just turned 17 and her record had been out for a couple of months and I was really impressed by the record when it came out and that was one of the reasons I went to, to meet with her. That uh, her songs uh, sounded very refreshing to me because this was a teenager who was um, happy to sound like a teenager. We'd had uh, the, the Britneys and Christina Aguilera's and performers like that where everybody's trying to move beyond their years. And she was happy being in the years that she was living in. And it sounded very believable. The album sold 39,000 copies during its first week and went on to sell 5.5 million copies worldwide. Shortly after the release of her debut album, she went on to win a string of high-profile awards. Swift and Alan Jackson were jointly named the Nashville Songwriter Association Songwriter Artist of the Year in 2007, with Swift becoming the youngest person ever to be honored with the title. She also won the Country Music Association's Horizon Award for Best New Artist. The Academy of Country Music Awards Top New Female Vocalist and the American Music Awards Favorite Country Female Artist Honor. She was also nominated for a 2008 Grammy Award in the category of Best New Artist, but lost to Amy Winehouse. As well as extensive touring and taking part in large amounts of meet and greet sessions with her adoring fans, Taylor was about to tap into a new way of communicating with her fans. The rise in popularity of social media coincided with the release of her debut album, and she became part of a new generation of music stars. I think Taylor Swift's use of social media, uh, MySpace, Twitter, all of these uh, new media avenues, um, does make her the first of a probably a new kind of artist and certainly a new kind of country artist, because that simply had not been done before she did it. Most of the country artists had websites by that point. Uh, a lot of them would have had email lists, things like that. But it, it, it wasn't the kind of 
sort of flat connectivity that you get with places like Facebook and Twitter. You know, MySpace starts in 2003. It's really hitting its peak just as Taylor starts to launch her career. Facebook comes along a little bit later. Twitter actually starts while Tim McGraw is on the charts. And so they, you know, so, so Twitter really comes along at the same time that Taylor Swift does. I think it was a combination of innocence and savvy in that this is the way kids communicate and she's a kid. Um, and it's a new way of, of building a fan base that didn't exist before. And she, she will go down in history as the gal who lit, held the beacon up and said, this is the way to go. And the industry follows. You know, Taylor kind of took advantage of the new tools that were at her disposal and really kind of set the standard for how country acts would think about interacting with their fans online in ways that they hadn't done or hadn't been able to do before. Swift's second studio album, Fearless, was released in November 2008. She co-produced the album with Nathan Chapman. My, my new CD comes out November 11th, and the first single just came out on iTunes and stuff, so I'm really excited. It's a song that I wrote by myself, and having written every song on the new record and co-produced it, I'm just so excited for people to hear it. The lead single from the album, Love Story, was released in September 2008 and became the second best-selling country single of all time, peaking at number four on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. You know, on Love Story, Taylor talks a lot about the kind of trials and travails of being a high school girl and getting your heart broken. She does everything from talk about, you know, a cute boy in her math class she has a crush on to getting her heart broken by a boy who promised to love her forever and always. I think that uh, for Taylor Swift, she still experiences life love and disappointment the way the rest of us do. And despite the fact that people may be a lot older or from different cultures or different perspectives, um, I think she really gets to the heart of what all of us feel in those situations. Hence, her incredible mainstream and widespread appeal. The release of her second album coincided with a short-lived relationship with Joe Jonas from the Jonas Brothers. The couple dated for several months before an infamous phone call put an end to the relationship. Yeah, so after she started getting some success, suddenly, you know, other famous people are, are interested in her and she has a dating life. And at, at one point she was, uh, she was seeing Joe Jonas of the Jonas Brothers and uh, wasn't, wasn't hesitant, didn't bat an eye in talking about that, that he had called her up on the phone to break up. And she said, I clocked it. I looked at, looked at my cell phone record after he was done, and it was 27 seconds. He spent 27 seconds on the phone breaking up, and I think that's bad. <laughs> and she writes about, about that stuff. The album debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 album chart with sales of over 500,000 copies and has since sold 8.6 million copies worldwide. I remember talking to her and she's going, I'm so excited for you to, to hear um, where we're going because um, it, it's going to be so much better. Um, and she, you could see how excited she was. And she, you know, in, insisted on playing some things for me and, you know, she had, had her iPod there and she's zipping through and going, okay, you got to hear this one. You gotta, and then, oh, what should I play you next? And, and goes on to the next one. So I got a, a preview of it and uh, was uh, impressed by uh, the amount of growth that, that I heard from, you know, two years before. Uh, you could hear now what she was writing about when she was 15 and 16 very, and still in high school, very different than 17 and 18. Now she's, you know, getting up out into the world and at this point she's um, uh, getting um, her career is really taking off while she still is working on graduating from high school. Swift went on her first headlining tour in support of Fearless. She played shows in North America, Europe, Australia, and Asia. The tour was attended by more than 1.1 million fans and grossed over $63 million. I'm just so excited. I cannot believe all the sellouts. Like, when I get a call like that, when they're like, oh, 
By the way, um, the tour sold out in Madison Square Garden in a minute. I, I just, I don't know how to react to that other than to just start jumping up and down and screaming. I always expected to have to do a lot of stressing out about selling tickets. And then I went on my first headlining tour and everything just sold out. And I was like, really, this is how this works? Um, I've never expected that kind of success. I've never just felt entitled to my shows selling out or things like this happening to me, but the fact that they have happened to me has been wonderful, and um, I hope that the second leg of the tour is as successful as the first. This tour has been so amazing because the fans have just absolutely made me feel like I've won the lottery of dreams coming true. Um, when I'm up there and I look down and I see all of these t-shirts that people have made and um, the signs that they make are hilarious. Just very creative. It's gonna be so sad knowing that we're not gonna see each other for a while. Everybody on the tour, from the lighting to the crew to the dancers and the band and everybody that have just become even more of my family in the last couple of months. Um, but the last weekend of the tour is also elaborate pranking. They, they think they're cool because they'll like come out for the encore with us and stick a band-aid on somebody's back or something and they're like, <laughs> and we're like, you don't even know what's coming in Minneapolis. It's going down. Swift became the first country music artist to win an MTV Video Music Award when You Belong to Me was named Best Female Video in 2009. Her acceptance speech was interrupted by rapper Kanye West, and the incident received much media attention. Everyone was shocked. Here comes Taylor to, to you know, receive a very well-deserved reward, and he gets up and makes an absolute idiot of himself, rambling about Beyonce, who looked horrified in the audience. He was not doing her any favors either. And she just handled it very gracefully, incredibly professionally. I think what was interesting to me about that whole debacle was that the world, really the world, kind of stood up and said, leave her alone, don't pick on her, we like her. I mean, here was a 300-pound gorilla stomping on a baby kitten, you know, and everybody in the world saw that for what it was. And the way she handled it was classic Taylor. You know, she was just as gracious as ever. I think that's one of those places where she kind of grew up in the public eye because people saw from that that she could handle a crisis situation and just stay calm, just go on about things. She was very gracious. She never really criticized Kanye, who basically went into hiding after the incident because he had embarrassed himself so badly and ended up apologizing uh, profusely on Twitter uh, for really uh, offending not just Taylor, but really a lot of her fans. Taylor brushed off the incident and went on to end the year in tenacious style. Fearless was named Album of the Year and Best Country Album, while White Horse was named Best Country Song and Best Country Female Vocal Performance. She was the youngest artist ever to win Album of the Year and became the youngest artist and one of only six women to be named Entertainer of the Year by the Country Music Association. Well, tonight I'm just gonna I'm just gonna dance around with my band and my crew and my record label and freak out because honestly, I never imagined that the unattainable thing that I had always held in my mind and my imagination would happen to me at 19. And I've watched every single year of my life, I've watched the CMA Awards. Every single year that I couldn't remember watching CMA Awards. So I know what this means, and that's why I am so at a loss for words right now. Um, so uh, 
Addressing the pace of my career, I feel like I can, I look at it from both ways. Of course, this feels like, it feels like just yesterday that I was knocking on doors of Nashville going, hey, will you listen to my demo? Uh, but then again, I feel so lucky to know you guys and to have talked to you in press rooms and um, to have been an opening act for every single person that I was nominated against in the Entertainer of the Year category. Um, I'm just, I'm just very appreciative right now. Swift went on to win four Grammy Awards in 2010 from a total of eight nominations. This is the dream come true. It's, um, it's like, I've never been presumptuous about dreams. And um, when you have crazy dreams, like, I wonder what it would be like to win a Grammy someday. I, I never actually could fathom that it might happen until I was walking up there and winning one. Swift released her third studio album, Speak Now, in October 2010. She wrote all 14 songs on the album and co-produced it. Musically, it has been said that the album expands beyond country pop to border both alternative rock and bubblegum pop. The album's lead single, Mine, was released in August 2010, and a further five singles were released throughout 2010 and 2011. I got to uh, get a little preview of it. I was the only journalist allowed into the studio with her while she was recording it. Um, she was out here in Hollywood uh, adding some strings to a couple of the songs back to December and Haunted. And I, I wanted to see uh, how she works creatively behind uh, the mixing board, not just, just in the studio as a, as a singer. And we know how she works as a songwriter. Uh, but to see her um, develop the, the overall sound of, of her records. And um, she was so excited to have uh, this like 26-piece orchestra um, being conducted by Paul Buckmaster, a very uh, major orchestrator and arranger conductor in, in pop music circles going back to the days of Elton John's early records. Um, and she was so jazzed uh, to hear the orchestra playing her music uh, because that's the thing that, that really comes across to me that the most important thing to her in her career is being a songwriter. Speak Now was a major commercial success, debuting at number one on the U.S. Billboard 200 chart. Its opening sales of 1.5 million copies made it the 16th album in U.S. history to sell 1 million copies in a single week. As a result of selling 20 million albums worldwide, Taylor was presented with a special plaque from Scott Burchetta, representing her 20 million album sales. Oh my God! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what? Kind of so Taylor, guys, oh, take that. on behalf of Big Machine Records yeah, and our partners, Universal Music Group Worldwide, we are so proud to present to you this plaque that indicates you have sold more than 20 million records worldwide. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I have to find a wall big enough for this. I'm absolutely blown away by the 20 million records plaque. Um, it's just sort of beyond my comprehension to get a plaque like that. And the fact that the fans have done that much for me in such a short period of time is just unreal. And I'm so excited and so thankful. I remember, you know, coming up in the music industry and like I would make goals for myself that were just ahead of the last goal I had just accomplished. I would never make a goal that was so, um, so far down the line that I felt like it, it was unattainable. A 20 million record plaque in my mind is just always seems unattainable. I never would have imagined that that would be a possibility for a goal. Um, I was hoping to be able to sell one record, you know. Um, be able to make a record, to be able to have songs that people could hear. That's like, the fact that that's happening now and the 20 million plaque, it's just, it's all the fans and I'm just at a loss again for words. Taylor embarked on the Speak Now World Tour in 2011 and visited Asia, North America, Oceania, and Europe. She ended the European leg of the tour at the O2 Arena in London. Well, hello, London. And welcome to the Speak Now World Tour. I'm Taylor.
finishing the tour in Europe uh, at the O2 Arena in London with a sold out show is, um, I couldn't think of a more perfect way to end this European run. I've gotten to experience just parts of the world I never thought I'd get to see. Nonetheless, play shows in and have the crowds singing the words back to me. As a songwriter, to have people singing the lyrics back to you in countries where they don't even really speak English, it's like so gratifying. It just, it's been a really beautiful tour here and finishing it here at the O2 is just so perfect. Taylor Swift's fourth studio album, Red, was released in October 2012. It was with this album that Taylor started to experiment with her music and created singles for a pop demographic. The album's lead single, We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together, became Swift's first number one on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 chart. Production-wise, in, in terms of the sound of the record, it's, it's very different. Um, it's the first album track that she's ever done where it wasn't just her and her producer Nathan Chapman where she's working with Max Martin and Shellback out of Sweden and you know those are the guys that make those big dance pop records and it's and so it's in, in a lot of ways it's much more like that it's very much a pop record there's a country mix to it but it's really clearly an effort to go make a big pop record but it's almost like the Swedish dance pop version of what an old Taylor Swift song should have sounded like. Yeah, you know, so she's working with different producers, she's working with different songwriters, she's got some guests in on the album, and it's really about seeing what she can learn, seeing what she can do with all of these other people, and, 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 and kind of learning just how broad the Taylor Swift sound is gonna go. We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together and I Knew You Were Trouble were both international hits. I Knew You Were Trouble was written about One Direction's Harry Styles, who Taylor dated for several months around the time of Red's release. One of the things I think people like about Taylor Swift, particularly her young fans, is that her awkwardness with men. She has been dumped, she has been rejected, and she sings about it very openly. Taylor herself has said, you know, I'm not the girl who always has a boyfriend, I'm the girl who rarely has a boyfriend. And I think a lot of girls who feel awkward of any age uh, can relate to that. Any British men on the horizon? I mean, for what kind of horizon? There's so many different kinds of horizons. On the romantic horizon. And nothing on the romantic horizon, come on. Okay. As part of the Red Tour, Swift played 86 dates in North America, New Zealand, Australia, Europe, and Asia. I'm really excited about being in China for the first time. Uh, it's really exciting to bring the Red Tour here because having never been here, I I'm most excited about the fact that the show in Shanghai sold out in under a minute. That was unbelievable. So it makes me even more excited to play the show knowing that there was that much demand here. It's really exciting going somewhere new because I've done so much international touring that you very rarely get to be in an entire country you've never even stepped foot in before. So that kind of experience is always really exciting. And there are lots of different places we're going on this Asia tour where I've, I've never been there before, but surprisingly, we, we, the shows have sold out. So I think that, like I said, that's the most exciting thing that these audiences have been so excited about the show being here. It's, it's hard to try and figure out why my music works so well uh, in Asia and why the fans like it so much. I, I'm honored by the fact that they, you know, even if English isn't their first language, they would learn the words to my songs and sing them back to me in concert. That's, it's really fun for me to know that they put that much effort in. Um, and also, it's that kind of amazing reminder that music is one of those unifying factors that works all over the world and um, looking out into the crowd and being in a completely new place, seeing that it's sold out, seeing that people know the words to the songs, it's really, really incredible. So we're in Shanghai. Uh, we're actually gonna do a dress rehearsal to prep for the Asian tour and although it's predominantly the same set list and production elements as the North American and the things we've done in the UK, it's, uh, it's good to kind of get back in the swing of things. So I'm gonna do a dress rehearsal and everybody's in full costume. So we're gonna go do that now to a completely empty arena. 
tomorrow things will look a lot different. <laughs> I, I'm really excited about the idea of touring all over the world and, and putting out albums that will translate all over the world and, um, you know, musically. I think, I think that's been a huge motivating factor for me in making new music is, is making sure that it's music that um, people will love in America and maybe, maybe they'll love in Asia and maybe they'll love in Europe and that's been a new thing I've really hoped for, um, being able to travel internationally and tour internationally. The Red Tour was attended by 1.7 million fans and grossed over $150 million. Swift won three MTV European Music Awards in 2012, including the honors for Best Female and Best Live Act. I Knew You Were Trouble won Best Female Video at the 2013 MTV Video Music Awards. She was named Best Female Country Artist at the 2012 American Music Awards and was named Artist of the Year at the 2013 ceremony. And in classic Taylor Swift fashion, she was already focusing on her next album. Thank you so much. The winning Artist of the Year for the third time is kind of a little bit mind-numbingly unbelievable. And I'm just, it, it is, it's a little bit hard to absorb it all at once to answer your question. It's amazing. And the fact that it's fan voted makes it that much better. This year has been unreal for me with this album. I didn't, I don't expect things to do well just as by default. So for this to happen is, is wonderful. Can Thank you talk you. about where you are on your next album? Ooh, yes I can. That's my favorite thing to talk about. Um, I, we're, I'm so obsessed with, with, with where it is right now because um, I think for me the goal is that we start coming upon a sound that, that's different from everything we've done before and an identity to a new record and having come upon that so early in the process just is, is really thrilling. And you know, I mean, I've got a lot of time to write more, but it's really looking, it's really looking promising so far. Like, that, like how many things I've got finished that I love that I know I want on the record. It's more than, it's way ahead of schedule to answer your question. I'm really stoked for you to hear it. 1989, Swift's fifth studio album was released towards the end of 2014. Taylor described 1989 as her first official pop release and parted ways with some members of her longtime band. As part of the 1989 promotional campaign, Swift invited fans to secret album listening sessions called the 1989 Secret Sessions at her houses in New York, Nashville, and Los Angeles. The album's lead single, Shake It Off, was released in August 2014 and reached number one on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100. 1989 sold just fewer than 1.3 million copies in the U.S. during the first week of release, selling more copies in its opening week than any album in the previous 12 years. This achievement made Swift the first and only act to have three albums sell more than one million copies in the opening release week. It later became the best-selling album of 2014, selling 3.6 million copies. Swift was named Billboard's Woman of the Year in 2014. She is the only artist to be awarded this title twice. At the 2015 Grammy Awards, Shake It Off was nominated for three awards, including Record of the Year and Song of the Year. While at the 2015 Brit Awards, Swift won the International Female Solo Artist Award. Now, Taylor, tell us how you feel about winning your first ever Brit Award. I'm way too excited about it. I need to calm down. Um, I'm so excited. I'm so happy. It's been um, it's been the most amazing slow build with you know my love affair with England and the UK and you know starting out playing King's College and ending up eight years later getting ready to play sold out Hyde Park is like what? So um, th this first Brit Award couldn't have come at a better time. I'm so happy. Honestly, it's amazing. The reaction to 1989 has been incredible. You must be very happy with the way your fans and all your new fans have taken to your new music. I'm really happy with it. And thank you for saying that you listen to it all the time. That's really nice. Um, I'm so proud of this album. And I feel like I've been very lucky that my, my kind of creative evolution has taken 
just as long as my growth in England. It, it, you know, I've been writing songs since I was 12 years old, and with every album, they've changed. 1989 is my favorite by far, so I'm really happy that's the one that people like the most. That's really convenient for me. And finally tonight, please tell us about your incredible performance. You were one of the first performers on stage. Uh, it was a big gig, a big, big one to start off with. And how was it for I you? I have no idea how it was because I haven't seen it back. <laughs> I'm terrified. But you think, you think it was good, so I trust you. You're not going to lie to me. We met five minutes ago. You wouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> I hope it was okay. I get really nervous at these things, but somehow, like, you put a crowd in a room and it gets it gets easier. And, um, you know, the Brits are so nice to let me open the show and give me stuff like confetti and cool lighting cues and the whole stage to work with. I had a really fun time, and I can't believe that, like, all the things I have to do tonight are over now, and I just get to hang out. What will you do now? You've got a lot of friends here. Yeah, I do. I'm going to go hang out with them. I'm going to Ed's about to perform, so I'm going to run now. You enjoy Ed Sheeran and thank you for talking to us. Congratulations. Thanks guys. Taylor See Swift ya. everybody. During another year of personal triumph for Swift, in March 2015, she started dating record producer and DJ Calvin Harris. By June 2015, the duo were ranked as the highest paid celebrity couple over the past year by Forbes, with combined earnings of over $146 million. She was the girl who dared to dream. She chose her career path and turned her dreams into reality with a combination of talent and unparalleled desire to reach the top. She is one of the most successful musicians of recent times, and with her recent humbling of Apple, no doubt, one of the most powerful too. Her music has evolved and has transcended genres, and with her style continuing to grow, she will no doubt continue to release multi-platinum albums and play sellout shows around the world. Taylor has talked a lot about how she's an overachiever. She's very driven and very motivated and you know she doesn't want to be known uh, for anything bad. She wants to be known for only good things. You know, she's obviously someone who's very hard on herself, but has a tremendous amount of self-belief and determination. It occurs to me how lucky I am, actually. I get so excited about it, and I wake up with a smile on my face, and honestly never thought I'd get to do this stuff, so being here is unbelievable. If I was a popular culture mogul, who wanted to know the hearts and minds of young American women, I would pay real, real close attention to every word that woman says, everything she does, everything she sings. I think she is an iconic American gal right now. Maybe the iconic American gal. Her journey will continue to fascinate the showbiz world for years to come.